Uh, well, thanks, Ale and, and uh, Doge for the invitation to be here. Great to see you all. Um, so uh, as Ale just said, I'm uh, Austin Sendek. I'm my sort of work two jobs. The vast majority of my time is uh, focused on running um, AIonix, which is a uh, hard to spell and hard to say uh, company name that's supposed to merge. It yeah, it's okay. Everyone says it wrong. There is no canonical pronunciation. Uh, but the idea is to converge, uh, you know, AI and ionics. And so, um, you know, that means that we're mostly working on electrochemical systems and sort of accelerating their design with uh, with the, these exact kind of approaches that we're talking about. Um, as adjunct faculty at Stanford, I teach um, DFP courses, um, so computational material science, and I'm involved in a number of research um, programs there in the same, same area. Um, so I will. Uh, you're you're going to see my academic roots when you see how um, how ugly my slides are compared to the last two uh, very nice presentations. Um, can everyone see my plain white slides? Okay, cool. Um, so I'll start by just giving a, um, a a brief summary of a recent success story that we've had. Um, so uh, at Aionics, we work, like I said, mostly with electrochemical uh, materials design and. Most of our success stories are um, are locked behind NDAs, and so it can be tough for us to talk about many of them. But this one we can share publicly, and so I'm happy to share this with you. This came out of our work with um, Sepion Technologies. Uh, Sepion is a uh, it's a um, a battery company uh, here in the Bay Area, and relatively early stage startup. And we worked together on an electrolyte design project with them, and this project was. Something like, um, hey, we have a certain number of experiments we can do. We have a certain um, performance um, you know, profile that we want to see in our batteries. Typically, that we want to uh, extend the cycle life of the, of the cells as long as possible. And we want to tune the electrolytes um, you know, iteratively using kind of data-driven um, models guiding to, to guide our, our choice of materials. And so this is just the plot. I've redacted the sort of key numbers, the, the battery capacity and the number of cycles. Um, but what this plot represents is you know, each of these lines is uh, a unique electrolyte formulation that has been tested. And uh, the, the y-axis here is the capacity of the battery. The x-axis is the number of cycles that the battery has run. And so you want these lines to be you know, drawn out as long as possible to say, hey, this, you know, this battery can cycle for a thousand cycles or five thousand cycles with keeping that capacity high, and um, the the kind of success story that came out here was um, the project started with this black line, and um, within six weeks of essentially active learning on material composition to predict these key performance metrics and then to select uh, the next you know the next um, next material to experiment with, we were able to. Uh, to increase the cycle life of the cells by 82% within six weeks. And uh, so this was really um, a, and this project you know, continued for many weeks beyond this, um, but I think this initial boost was a very exciting um, start to the project that was enabled by this active learning um, case. And so every week we would screen about a million candidate formulations um, for, for Sepion and they would test a handful of them. Um, this was also very exciting because these materials um, outperformed pretty significantly some of the, the best recommendations from the literature. Um, the, the unique kind of details of, of the cells here meant that those literature recommendations weren't really particularly appropriate for the applications that they wanted. And so there really was a need to kind of come up with a proprietary uh, customized model just for this cell, just for this company, just for this data set to enable them to, to you know, identify the right materials. Um, if you want to learn more, uh, Dr. Jessica Golden of um, Stepion gave a talk uh, in our uh, webinar series, Aionix Fortnightly, and um, that was about um, about a year ago. Actually, it might have been two years ago, but that's available on YouTube. So um, if you want to hear her talk for about an hour about this uh, program, at Sepion, I would invite you to um, to check that out. It's, it's called uh, AI and Materials Development in the Real World. So that's a, a very quick description of what we do at Aionics. And um, I wanted to, I was thinking about this, this prompt of um, where are the challenges that are worth addressing? And I think there's a lot of them. I would agree with really everything that's been said so far. 
Um, I, I think for myself sitting sort of at the nexus of industry and academia, probably spend a lot of time thinking about how do we get research and how do we get data specifically across this you know, chasm of death that separates academic work from industry. And um, one of the frustrations that we've been dealing with at a Aonics, you know, for a long time, but we've been feeling it a lot more recently, is it's simply just finding uh, finding models and finding data that have been put forth by academic groups and being able to use them uh, in our work, right? And so when we come into a project like the one I've described with Sepion, the, there's there's a question of, um, okay, we need a good model to predict the melting point of a material. Okay, such and such group has published this model. This is the top tier model. It has this amount of error. And if you just have the data set and you train this random forest and you do this and you do that, you can have access to this amazing model. So we say, okay, let's do that. Someone spent a, you know, a third of their PhD working on this, so we might as well use it. And uh, getting that data is often very, very difficult. So uh, a few quick points I wanted to share. Um, companies like us and other, you know, other companies in industry really often want to rely on what the academic community is doing to power their R&D. Um, efforts to um, for this, this fair data um, framework, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reproducible are of course very important. Um, but even when that data is in a great format and standardized, et cetera, it can often still be locked behind walls in journals. Um, and uh, academic groups typically don't wanna pay to open source journals because, or to, to pay open source fees for these articles that can be quite expensive. It can be in the thousands of dollars. And uh, many groups often don't like to publish their papers on services like archive. Um, so it gets you into this interesting and challenging spot. Um, platforms like Deep Dive are working to solve this. And I hope I'm not offending anyone uh, who might be here from Deep Dive by saying this, but um, platforms that sort of allow you to pay for um, uh, your know, journal access without sort of subscribing to every journal are very interesting, but currently deficient in that they don't support enough journals and they often don't even allow you to get into the supplementary information. So I think there's a lot more work that needs to be done there. And going directly to authors, uh, the authors of papers is, is a challenge. It's often, you know, it's not scalable, right? You don't, no one wants to send out a zillion emails. Um, but even when you do that, it's often very difficult to get the data. And some of you may have seen this, this um, commentary in Nature that I thought was very interesting called uh, many research, researchers say they will share data, but don't. And if you haven't read this paper, I would really recommend it. Uh, one of the highlights was in order to write this paper, they, uh, the author, um, authors sent out requests to about um, 1,800 um, uh, authors of other papers requesting their data. And uh, these 1,800 manuscripts said that the data was available upon request, and 90% of the authors declined to share the data, um, either, either declined or did not answer the email, right? And so that's a major problem. Uh, only 7% of the time did they actually get the data. And uh, I think we should um, call a spade a spade and say, oftentimes the, the MO in industry is if you want a paper, uh, find someone that you just hired who is still has, you know, still has academic access through their, uh, their recent, you know, university affiliation who can go break the terms of service with their university uh, to download the paper for you and then send it to you. Um, and I've seen this kind of very widely used across industry. This is like not a good solution um, for a number of reasons, um, but it's a challenge. I think it's a challenge that that a lot of uh, a lot of companies like us face. Is you know how do you how do you sort of get this get access to this uh, this data, given that the people who are generating the data want to get it to you, um, you know you want it, and there's just this bridge uh, to to cross. 